I'm from Cambridge Cancer Genomics. So what we do is we combine artificial intelligence with advanced liquid biopsies. And we're doing this to provide real-time feedback on how a patient uh, responds to their cancer therapy and allow clinicians to rapidly iterate their treatment regimens and have a better response for patients in the end. So despite all of the advances in biotechnology and all the great stuff that we're all here to celebrate, all the immunotherapies, the reality is for a lot of patients with advanced stage cancer therapies or with advanced stage cancers is that the only option available is standard of care chemotherapy. So if we take colorectal cancer, for example, about 90 odd people, 90 odd percent of people with advanced stage will get full Fox, some variant of full Fox chemotherapy. And this has the response rate of about 30%. So if we think about this for a second, this means that 60% or 70% of patients are going to be on a cytotoxic chemotherapy for six months before they realize that they've had no clinical benefit whatsoever. And this really isn't good enough. So if you combine this idea of, of wasted money and wasted energy on ineffective therapies with the targeted agents which fail, the targeted agents which don't work very well for patients, you come up with a, a very large number which is, uh, represents a big proportion of the total socioeconomic cost of cancer in the developed world. And rather than trying to come up with better kind of predictive, bio, um, predictive biomarkers of how a patient will respond to therapy, what CCG is doing is turning the problem on its head and providing real-time feedback on how current response to therapy is going. So if we look about how we do this in a little bit more de uh, um, detail, what we do is we do advanced multi-omic profiling of the initial patient tumor prior to chemotherapy or prior to any kind of therapy. We can then take this huge expanded feature list and narrow it down to the real salient features which are really important for tracking that tumor in a patient's blood. We, use this, we do this using advanced um, artificial neural networks, and we filter mutations or uh, circular RNAs or lots of different features based on things like clonality, prevalence and relapse, prevalence in disease progression. We then design rapidly personalized assays to track these features in a patient's blood. We do this using common, already available lab technologies that the clinicians have access to. And we can then provide actual clinically actionable feedback to clinicians so that they can rapidly iterate their treatment um, paradigms. So where we are just now, so we've provided proof of concept data in some uh, human data sets and also some cell line models and some mouse models. And we've now collected about, or you know, kind of compressed together about 5,000 matched solid and liquid biopsies from 12 treatment centers around the world. And as far as we know, apart from the stuff that Grail doesn't tell us about, this is one of the biggest databases or, or biobanks of liquid biopsies available in the world. And we're doing multi-omics profiling of these matched solid and liquid uh, biopsies to feed into our um, artificial neural networks and really hone down our machine learning approaches so that we can get the most important features to track in a patient's blood. And again, the things that we're looking for are prevalence in relapse, prevalence in, in drug resistance, clonality, so presence across the whole tumor mass, et cetera. Um, and then we're then recruiting for about 100 patients in two clinical trial centers in California so that we can kind of prove that what we're doing is working and really have a final kind of proof of, of, this, of this technology. We've also started parsing the, the uh, clinicaltrials.gov database, which means that not only could we tell a clinician that the therapy that their patient is currently on is not working, we can provide um, knowledge or access to new novel clinical trials which are happening right now that they could send their patients to to be, to be enrolled in. Um, so that's us. So we are funded by Y Combinator and also by a very large clinical collaborator on the West Coast, which I think is very important because that kind of, these are our customers. These are our customers and they are, they are sponsoring us, which is really cool. We've now got two locations, one in Cambridge, one in San Francisco. Uh, we have a staff of about five or six people now, and we're recruiting for AI, machine learning, NGS, bioinformatics. So let us know if you, anybody wants a job. Uh, thank you very much. Th thanks, John. Um, now we're going over to the jury. Um, jury questions first, and then we'll open for the public, so to speak. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Thanks for your presentation. Could you comment on the business model and your plan for the company in the coming years? Sure. So right now we're focusing on uh, providing the, or working through this data that we've got just now. 
Uh, we're in YC, so we're going to be um, looking for seed funding in about September, so in larger seed round. Uh, going forward, we want to continue working with CBCC, next slide, who are you know, really good at doing cancer stuff. And these are our kind of customers in the, in the near term. Um, we are hope where we're very encouraged by the FDA's decision to kind of declare almost open season on all NGS technologies for going through into clinical trials and following the observational trial, which is hopefully going to be happening this year, we're going to move into proper clinical trials. We think we'll be in the market in about two years' time. So then what will you be selling? So we're selling a, it's a hybrid product and service. So it's the whole package. So it is the initial profiling of the patient's tumor, followed by the rapidly personalized assays and the software to analyze that and follow that up over time. Uh, thank, you for, thank you very much for this nice uh, speech. Um, uh, my question would be, uh, what are the major challenges that you foresee and how do you plan to, uh, to address them? Sure. So uh, well, one of the major challenges is the competition in this space. So we think that, so obviously, I, I guess to bring everybody up to speed, there's a lot of companies working on liquid biopsies, biggest of which is Grail, raised about a billion dollars in Series A uh, in January, so obviously they're massive. Hopefully some of that billion dollars is for acquisitions, so it's not all too bad. But um, so that's one of the big challenges, dealing with the competition in this space. And we think that by going to clinics as a very early stage company with our kind of our hands out asking for samples, we really have to refine the business model continually to fit into what they really want. So because we can't afford to pay for samples like some of our competitors do. And what they really want is speed and affordability. So they they don't want or they don't have time to wait for NGS approaches. They want something that gives them an answer very, very quickly. So it's about trying to get into the market and try and get first mover advantage before the bigger companies can kind of see what we're doing and try and stomp us out, I guess, is one of the biggest challenges. Can you help us understand what, what, uh, what you see as the key uh, milestone data point demonstration that you will have in the next two to four years? Uh, next two to four years, it's a long time. Uh, the next year, I think, is delivering on the observational clinical trial. We also, we want to turn, so we have 12 clinical collaborators just now, and we're really pushing on increasing that number and increasing the amount of data we have. But really, a major milestone for us is going to be converting one of those, essentially, collaborators into a customer, because these are the customers we eventually want to reach. So in the near term, we have the observational trial, followed by... Um, converting one of our collaborators into a customer. Thank you for the talk. Um, can you elabor elaborate a little bit on the, um, the data you have for the biopsies and the training you're doing uh, sure. for your AI so and what have, challenges there are? So we have, uh, like I say, we have now our own proprietary mix of about 5,000 matched solid and liquid biopsies. And obviously we know that one of the, the largest databases available of mutational data and RNA-seq data, et cetera, is based on solid tumors. So the first question we're asking is whether liquid biopsies are more representative of the clonal structure of a tumor than solid biopsies because of spatial heterogeneity. So we're hoping that by comparing solid to liquid, we can see if the mutational spectrum are the same, and the same from the same patient's tumors, or whether we need to increase some or change some sort of weighting in that when we move into looking at pure liquid biopsies. Um, yeah, so another important thing, obviously, is what we want to be able to do is take an individual patient's tumor and take all of the features from that tumor and reduce that down to the five or six key features to track um, the response to therapy in, in, from the blood. So deciding on or helping set the rules for how our machine learning algorithms are, are trained and how the features that they look for in the tumor is also very, very important. So we're doing a lot of work to compare uh, the spectrum of what is going on in a tumor that is relapsed versus what is going on in a tumor that is responding and how that can influence the, the weighting of our algorithms. Um, going forward, something that we've just started doing but I think is very powerful is, as I mentioned, parsing of the clinicaltrials.gov database. That is a big, big challenge just now because whoever fills out the clinicaltrials.gov database is not our friend, and they, they write everything in a way which is not standardized. It's very difficult to deal with. So we're having to do a lot of natural language processing technology or techniques to try and get 
pick the salient information from the clinicaltrials.gov database so then we can um, eventually end up in a place where we can not only tell a clinician that the therapy that they put their, on, their patient on is not working, it's, or it, it is working, um, it's not working, but the, there is a new clinical trial happening in Denver, and it looks like your patient would respond to the therapy that's offered um, by this trial. I have a final one. Um, when, you when you look at the progression of the cancer, how often would you need to do the testing and, and the cost associated? Sure. So we are, we're currently at about $50 per biopsy. Um, obviously, the initial biopsy is a little bit more expensive because we're using NGS. Uh, we have some proprietary tech, some array technology, which will bring this down to about $20 per test. And this is really, this is one of our great USPs because it's very difficult to do, for example, Innovata does targeted sequencing. It's very difficult to do targeted sequencing of the blood for $50. So this allows us to do much, uh, take liquid biopsies very much more often than our competitors. So we're currently looking at taking them every time a patient, uh, like in colorectal cancer, they're on full fox, they go in about every week or every two weeks. Uh, we're looking at taking a biopsy every two weeks, taking 10 mils of blood when you go into ke for chemotherapy and then starting to give as close to real-time feedback on treatment response as we can do. Just a question on adoption. So if you get to that point where you feel confident in being able to give a instruction effectively to sure. the oncologist, um, traditionally medicine's been very much an apprenticeship kind of way of learning from key opinion leaders. How do you think oncologists will respond to being told what to do? <laughs> we'll, we'll, try and, we'll try and avoid putting it so blunt, bluntly, I guess. Um, so if you think about this, this is, just, this is another technology which is able to give them feedback on how their therapy choices are working. So it's like being able to give a, or have a PET scan every week, for example. So we see that the, the oncologist will see this data and they will take it under advisement not necessarily they're going to be like, okay, I'll definitely do what that says. It'll still, there'll still be some judgment taken in, I guess. But I'm sure that is a big challenge. Okay, then uh, let's open this to the public. Um, who, who's got a, qu a question for John? Over there. Hi. Yeah, Hi. you're talking about the timing, the time it takes. How long does it actually take from the liquid sampling to the result? <laughs> um, about two or three hours. It's very, very three fast. Hours. So... And is that with the AI and the analysis and everything? So the AI runs in about an hour. So we have some technology for lab and a chip extraction of DNA from a patient's blood, which means we can do that without a lab. And then following that up with the array tech, we're looking at half an hour, currently about two hours for uh, running the assays. That's pretty fast. It's pretty fast, yeah. <laughs> Compared to like, I don't know, well, I, I, our sequencing facility is currently under like a four month backlog or something. I'm sure sequencing doesn't usually take that long, but that's how long it's taken right now. So compared to four months, three hours is pretty fast. Next question. Uh, yep. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. What are your fundraising plans? There's a reason why Crail has raised a billion and Foundation Medicine uh, got acquired by Roche. Sure. So um, we have just probably just under a million dollars just now. Um, in September, we we're hoping to complete a seed, a large seed round off the back of YC, which is looking at probably about $3 million. We think we can get something onto the market with $5 million, so if you have a, you're shaking your head. If you have a, um, <laughs> so even if it's just first entry into one or two specific clinics, I think we're okay. Okay, uh, one last question over there. Sorry, there's uh, I'm s I don't think I understand. Oh, sure. Yeah. What happens if you're Um, so I think that they are guidelines because they're meant to guide the doctor, and if the doctor can see that a tumor is not shrinking in response to chemotherapy or response to a specific therapy, I think they can take that under advisement. Um, there was, I don't know if everybody, anybody saw, but there was an editorial in Nature about two months ago which talked about this kind of rapid iteration of treatment regimen and dosing people with, with uh, cancer suboptimally with chemotherapy to try and um, kind of maintain their tumor burden at a manageable level. So I think there is, there is some 
energy to change the way that, that we think about treating cancer because there's no benefit to giving somebody chemotherapy for six months if their tumor is not shrinking. Yeah, th thank you, John. Thank you. Um, give it up for John. Round of applause, please.